But once the people catch on fire, it turns red and orange. Because the people and the combustion of human flesh, again, not for young audience, um, the combustion of human flesh is much less hot. The fire it produces is a, a lot less hot than the fire that's created in your body. So this is a great example if you want to talk about combustion, if you want to talk about black body radiation for those in advanced physics, if you want to talk about heat, this is a great way to do it, is looking at all the different types and different temperatures of fire that are produced <coughs> by one dragon. Um, and he, his fire is also why he torches the lamps. Um, so, if you look, he has yellowish white fire, he has grown significantly, and his fire has increased too. So we learned two things. He's getting from the needle to torture village, and on top of that, as he gets bigger, his fire gets hotter. So we can use physics to answer both of those questions. So now, um, this is another great demo. Um, this is one, if you take a dollar bill, dip it in water, dip it in rubbing alcohol, and let rubbing alcohol melt on the thing, um, and light it, all the rubbing alcohol burns off, but the dollar bill stays fine. So this is an amazing one. A lot of magicians will do this. It's not magic, it's just physics. Mm -hmm. Definitely research this demo and do it with your class. It's totally safe. I've never burned off an eyebrow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions that inevitably comes up, when you watch um, a bunch of guys, of uh, extras getting torched, a bunch of stunt doubles, is, well, two things. The first is, how are the actual people not dead? Um, the second is, if you had a dragon that was producing fire, why is his throat not hurting? Like, what is stopping it? And it turns out humans have developed some ways to really stop fire. And now water, as we know, puts out fire. And there's great fire retardant gel, and that's what the extras use. They end up uh, covering themselves in this fire retardant gel. And all it is is networks of molecules with water in between. And the molecules, you know, disintegrate with the water helps stop the fire. There is a limit though. At some point, that's all going to burn through. These fire retardant gels are liberated for time. They can withstand fire for X number of minutes. Um, so a lot of times when you have fire prevention, you end up with fire insulation, you end up having um, a rating for how long it could last. Now, um, there's another material called Kevlar, and I'm convinced that a dragon is really good uh, torch a city. Their throats are lined with Kevlar. This material is basically amazing, and the molecular, molecular structure doesn't combust. And this, anyone that's seen uh, fire dancers, if you've ever gone to Hawaii and seen these fire dancers, this is what they use. So they take their torches, soak it in a proprietary mixture of fuel, and burn it. Because that way the fuel burns without the material. So Kevlar is an absolutely amazing material. Now, for fire to work, uh, just like with the cornstarch demo I was able to do, um, you need a couple of things. You need a spark, you need something to burn, but you also need air. And another type of fire prevention takes away the air. Now, I wanted to show this because this is the house. Um, so this uh, here without the roof is the house next door to mine. Um, it has been completely, it was a house fire, completely burned down. This is my house, and fire never touched it. And that's because of a firewall. So firewalls are a third way to stop fire from spreading. There's, the way a firewall is made is it is one giant piece of thick drywall, and no air can get in, so it can't light fire. It can't catch on fire, because there's no way it can burn without having air. Now, um, it's rated for four hours. At some point, it was going to break down the fire and did it too, so my firewall is intact. Um, but this is yet another way to stop the spread of fire, is to keep the oxygen out. Same way corn starts with high level of light, but with the oxygenation it will. Now, why is this one? Now, we talked about dragons, and now I want to talk a little bit about white walkers and ice. So, this is Sam, the killer of the white walkers. That would be the white walkers. You can at least hear it. The sword shatters. He's really nervous. He's running. Trying to protect the other baby, which is difficult.
and being able to cut a human hair the hard way. Not the long way. Um, just like Valerius did. So, um, Valerius still made in Damascus. So Damascus steel, it also has this beautiful, beautiful pattern, much like what Valerian steel is described as. This is really a great real-life example of what's going on. The thing with Damascus steel is it has a very, very high carbon content, which is different from other steels. Um, very difficult to make. But one of the most important um, properties and ways to deal with Valerian steel is it has to be quenched in a certain way. And now, those of you that have read the books and know about the creation of the flaming sword, which I can never pronounce, um, you know that to create this sword, he had to quench it in the heart of his wife, his Anissa. And that's not far from the myths about what happened with Damascus steel. The idea is that it was quenched in dragon blood, which is, you know, goat donkey or the urine of redheaded boys. <laughs> so, um, but what's interesting with this is particularly, this is easier to come by, um, particularly with this, that, that acid etched away some, uh, some of the edge of the, of the steel blade as it quenched it. And what it did was expose carbon nanotubes. So, this is where modern science meets ancient weaponry. And these carbon nanotubes, this is one of the first instances of carbon nanotubes being created on purpose, whether or not they knew they were doing it. So the carbon and steel formed these rolls um, around a certain type of steel core. Um, it's the stiffest material known to, to man, and it can hold up to three elements. I like to weigh things in the unit of elephant. Um, so one of these wires could hold up three elephants, which Cersei never saw. Um, <laughs> or you come here for me, the elephant show. So it would take 377 of Cersei's not elephants to actually bend it. So really, she wasn't missing much. <laughs> now, this is a great also science story of how this came to be. There are groups arguing about how to create it. And then someone finally just image the edge and say, hey, look, this is a thing we can do. So those of you that are teaching about kind of more modern physics and want a real life example of the importance of something like carbon nanotubes instead of them just being an interesting thing to talk about, this is a great one. This is what makes Valyrian steel or Damascus steel so, so, so special. And carbon nanotubes happen often, we just don't know it because we can't image it. So this is also a great example of how imaging is the next step really in understanding not just the creation of something. That imaging piece is really, really important. And those of you that are here, has anyone heard of graphene? A couple of people. Um, graphene really it won a Nobel Prize uh, a few years ago. And the thing that a lot of physicists say really won the Nobel Prize is not the creation of graphene. Who's heard about how graphene is made? So graphene is made through a process called micromechanical cleavage. That sounds fancy, right? Really, the dude stuck scotch tape to pencil lead and ripped it off. And that's it. <laughs> but what he did was he imaged it. And he was able to show that graphene was created. So the Nobel Prize is really for this amazing imaging, not necessarily the creation of graphene. We've all asked how to make graphene. And um, this is the same thing. It was the imaging that was important, not just the creation. Another thing I want to talk about is the ice fall, which is now not there, and I can go into a long story about, you know, whether or not it should be. But this ice wall, um, its dimensions are described in the book, but not necessarily on the show. Um, so I took the dimensions from the book, but this gives you an idea of exactly why it's a great defense. The uh, wildlings are climbing it, and it's hard, um, but it's also just huge, intimidating, tall, you can't burn it down unless you're an ice dragon, um, and uh, it just absorbs anything you throw at it. It's not going to crack. It is a great defense system. And in seeing this, you might have the question, well, why, why in history did we not do this? Like, this is awesome. Turns out we did. Um, during World War II, um, someone tries to create a ship out of uh, an iceberg. 
And what they found is that if you mix sawdust with ice, it becomes very, very strong and breaks in a really regular way. Um, it was called pie creep. It was awesome and a complete failure because it turns out it's really hard to keep something super cold. But we tried this and it doesn't work. Now, how exactly does it not work? So, if we start here, this is uh, a little bit again why uh, the ice wall is a great defense. Um, and these are the uh, dimensions that you'll find in the book or a fan site. It was really hard to narrow these down, but it's not too different from what the show kind of looks with the Um So under pressure, um, okay, <laughs> sorry. Under pressure, ice has some interesting properties. It fractures, it melts, and it starts to slide. And so to give you an idea of the type of pressure the bottom of the wall is under, um, I'll just do a quick math problem. And this is great, um, again, if you're, if you're a physics teacher and doing this, I'm happy to slow this down and go through this. Feel free to take pictures. Um, but I won't dwell on the physics too much. Um, so pressure is really force per area. So the amount of force that's being pushed down in like a given, you know, one given area. And uh, the density of water is given there. Um, so the pressure is really the force here divided by the area. And what you get is that the force on one meter of the bottom wall is about 250 elements. So that ice is under enormous pressure. It's going to crack, but more importantly, it melts a little bit and it starts to slide. The wall is basically silly pipe. So the wall and icebergs in general, this is where a lot of mockery comes from, they take their the iceberg sequence to shape because they are really cold silly pipe. And they are moving out of the bottom based on this huge amount of pressure at the top. And again, that's still not enough to break the carbon nanotube, um, to give you an idea. So the ice wall starts to break um, under pressure. Ice is an amazing thing. It's way more interesting. Also, don't use whiskey stones, which is a very well known into afterwards. Um, and it gets even more complicated under pressure. But what um, a great, an absolutely great uh, glacier scientist named Martin Schrecker did is he took what he knew about how glaciers work and applied it to the wall. And he's not a fan of the show. He doesn't much care. I've had a long conversation with him. He's a lovely, lovely man, and he does this because his grad students think it's cool. So what he found is that at about zero degrees, so about freezing, the wall over even just one year would turn essentially into a city of silly putty hill. Over the thousands of years it was supposed to have stood, it would basically be a silly putty pancake. Like, this is a ice wall, not an ice wall. Even if it was super cold up there, about negative uh, 40 degrees, you still have this gradual sinking of the wall. So we wouldn't have the wall we're used to seeing. Even if it, you can get this very, very cold and you still end up with this melting. Now, one of the things I like to always do is compare things to real world examples. So, I want to know what exactly, what's the pitch here if I end up having this type of pancake? Now, I'm a cyclist, I love doing triathlons, and one of the triathlons, even I'm scared to do, and I've done some dumb shit, like, <laughs> even one of the ones I'm scared to do is called Savage Man in Maryland, and it has what they call the Western Port Wall. And if you ever want to watch funny fails on YouTube, look up Western Port Wall fails, and it's a bunch of really fit cyclists trying to go up a hill and falling over terribly. And then, like, one chick on a pink bike just smoking them. And it's kind of awesome. But the pitch, this is the Wall of Westeros, ends up being about the same pitch as the Great Wall of Western Port. Now, it's not going to be easy to get up if you're wobbling with snow tires, but I've walked up this wall just fine. So the wall links could easily, easily cross an actually physically correct wall. And so this, if you're looking at um, ice in particular or states of matter, this is a great problem to do with your students. And also if you're looking at climate science, talking about why even glaciers don't get taller than they are. Now, okay, so for those of you keeping score about what George R. R. Martin gets right and what he told 
totally whiffs on, here's where we are. So try to find Pretty great. He showed that as Drogon grew up, his fire got hotter, and he did get to the point that he could melt things. Um, I am not going to go into the problem. I have a lot of feelings. I just don't have the science on this, like, on slides about how he can't infinitely produce fire torch an entire town and blow apart everything. That's another problem. Um, until the season, last two episodes, this was true. Um, that's a little bit, that's for editing. Um, Dragonglass killing White Walkers, also pretty great. Dragonglass would behave incredibly well at cold temperatures. Um, Valerian Steel, really similar to the properties of Damascus Steel, with real physical examples. Ice, the thing everybody knows about in Rounded Glass, didn't do so hot, also RIP from so, he did pretty well on some things, and not so great on others. Now, um, I have, I told you that there would be one final problem for those of you that got drafted to this talk, which is fewer of you given the, the audience. Um, but I always like to do this problem because if you are teaching intro physics, and you want to do a test problem about buoyancy specifically, this is an amazing problem. So, when I was, back in 1997, when I was in college, um, years ago, no, I will say, again, I cried at Dragon Deaths, I cried, I teared up with Drogon coming in. 1997, the movie Titanic came out. Now, I actually didn't cry at Jack's death, Burgundy Village, totally in tears, Jack dying, not so much. <laughs> but, one of the questions I left the movie theater with is, there was room on the raft. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there is room on, and it turned out it was a door, so if you watch the scene over and over again, like I did, you can see that it's a door, and there they could have played cards! <laughs> like, there shouldn't have been a problem. And so then James Cameron out came out and said, it's buoyancy! And finally I was like, yeah, we can solve that. Like, that's a thing I can do. Let me fact check it, because, yes, it's dramatic, but it would be great if he wasn't lying. So, let's do it. So, is it James Cameron or is it physics? You have a sh sinking ship, and you have a door. Now, I looked at the plans for Titanic, um, and from what I found, the door was probably oak. Two other woods were yews, teak, and pine. Now, I'm gonna assume oak. So, when you have a, an oak door, you've got two forces acting on it. You've got a force of the door pulling down, which is based just on the weight of the door, and the force, the pointed force of the water pushing up. So now, those of you that are physics teachers or took physics, you know that the only way everyone's going to stay with their heads above water on the door is if the buoyant force is greater than the weight of the door pulling down plus anybody on top of the, the door that's, you know, not submerged. So, I've got this buoyant force here. It ends up being about 2,500 newtons. So, uh, volume of the door does it. So, the force chest of the door is 1920. Now, let's add rows. And it was terrifyingly easy to find your way on the internet. <laughs> Shockingly so. Um, also, she. In the row, and I found it in an article about her being too big to play rows, which is absurd! Um, so I know I'm going to write that Now, now let's add Jack. Uh, his weight is disturbingly easy to find because apparently he was too skinny to be a leading man. I hate Hollywood. Now, <laughs> so, if you add all of this up, what you find is it's greater than the buoyant force. So indeed, there might have been room on the raft, but they're all too heavy. If you take off Jack, Rose lives, lives a long and happy life. <laughs> so, if the door was oak, this is what you get. If the door was teak, they'd all be dead, because teak is a lot denser. If the door were pine, they'd all be alive, because a pine is less dense, so less heavy. Um, so, more of the story, it wasn't James Cameron and Jack's death, it's based on physics and oak. Mm. And, yeah. <laughs> and if, if you want to prove this to any of your friends, which I know you all do, I did a blog post on it on the Physics Buzz blog that does 
all this math. So if there are I told you so you need to send now, there's, there's data. I am a PhD physicist and I say so. <laughs> <laughs> we should be left. Shockingly, it's not. <laughs> so I hope uh, we are asking for fun and sometimes a question. I hope you all had fun. I will give you this is uh, this is my handle both on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I love getting emails and questions. This is just, those are just a few of the problems that I do in the upcoming book reference book that you can pre-order now on Amazon. Um, it's through MIT Press, and I don't have